everybody welcome to omnic lab episode 89 joining us this week we have our typical typical setup with myself rob may from japan and andres all the way in atlanta georgia what's up what is up what is up i wouldn't say so typical so typical that we decided to mix it up and we're gonna have the one the only the skyline of skylines what's up dude Oh, I think you're I muted think there. He, he's muted. My good man. I'm not, we're good. We're good. I, I was. <laughs> we we're just. We we're just seeing if it worked, right? Uh, yeah. Nice to be on. <laughs> it's been a while since I was on, and uh, well, should be cool. Yeah, it's been a minute since we last have you. I remember you as a man of few words, but not as so few. So few that I didn't even hear you there. <laughs> That's the key. If you don't say anything, then everything you say is well, definitely not wrong. That's <laughs> <laughs> Wise words. Sorry. So you avoid saying something smart or sm something good, bad. But uh, this week, guys, we brought on Sky because we're going to be talking Junker Town. And um, we're also going to cover at the very tail end of the show, we got some exclusive, not released yet info on pick rates and win rates and stuff regarding the Mercy and Junkrat changes that have just gotten rolled out within this last week. We also have a new update about a new event coming this coming week um, called Year of the Dog, but we'll more on that later. So basically, we want to cover all of Junkertown and kind of get a quick synopsis of what you've been up to, Sky, and what's been going on. But uh, why, don't we, why don't we start with that? We'll get into the update real quick, and then we'll jump back into Junk Junkertown. So give us a quick, like elevator pitch of who you are what you do what you've been up to oh well uh you know i do a lot of youtube stuff for overwatch at least you know for a while i was doing it every day and uh have quite a few videos we're up to like 150 videos i think but i took i took wow, a little nice. bit of a break yeah it's, uh, it's crazy it's just it, time flies um but then we had the mercy thing the mercy matter right and that was a bit i think everyone figured oh they're just gonna nerf this hero right it's just it's going to be done pretty soon. So I, I took a little bit of a break. I'm like, oh, there's no point in talking about the game if the game's just going to change in a couple weeks. And then it was a couple weeks, and then it was a couple months, and then it was six months. <laughs> and then the well, Overwatch it, came has out. Has it really been six months? Yep, it's been a half a year. Wow. First, yeah. You said you've since, been playing a lot of Since the original PUBG, Resurrect right? got reworked, yeah. Yeah, the Senate, the Senate has passed bills. We've had tax reforms. Like everything's the government happened. shut down. The government shut down. <laughs> but Blizzard, they they uh, it took them six months to patch Blizzard. I mean, you <laughs> could argue that Blizzard shut down. So. When you put it that way. <laughs> they, they so what have you been up to? Uh, well, I've been so hiatus. <laughs> yeah, well, a little bit of hiatus. Like I've been I've been around and stuff for Overwatch. But I've always been really interested in getting to esports and trying to do that. And there just wasn't really any opportunity in Overwatch. So while I'm sticking with Overwatch for the YouTube and the community aspect, uh, I just don't think that there's really room for me to get a job as a commentator or something. So I switched over to PUBG to get into that and really help develop that scene. In fact, I commentated and produced the very first, fun fact, PUBG Premier Pro Level Tournament online. Oh, um, nice. Nice. Congrats. Ooh. Yeah, so they're they're doing they're doing tons of stuff now. It's pretty cool. Um, there's leagues with ten thousand viewers. That game week. is crazy how it has taken off. Just because it wasn't even out as a an, as an official release, and it already had hundreds of thousands of viewers on Twitch. It kind of blows mm -hmm. my mind. Compared to to Overwatch, I sometimes play a little bit of both. Uh, and jumping back back and forth is a little weird for me because PUBG. It's kind of like the opposite of Overwatch, right? Right? So rigid, no room for error. You have to be um, very cal calculated, uh, sneaky, 
compared to Overwatch with, you know, if you're playing Winston, you're coming in guns blazing. You don't care if they see you or hear you. You're just jumping in people's faces. How do you find that jumping from that game to the other, like the change of mentality? Or do you find some similarities in both? Well, yeah, they're way different. They're super, super different games, right? I mean, PUBG is this very slow paced, Mm -hmm. hard team, like very teamwork oriented and strategy oriented where you go through, you talk over things. And I mean, games last 33 minutes in that game. It's exact. Every game is basically the same length. It's 33 minutes. Uh, And it's the same life throughout the entire thing. You can die, right? But if you go through the entire game, it's 33 minutes or so. It's just one life. And you spend that entire time plotting through on this epic quest right where overwatch is much more of uh like an arena shoot you know twitch shooter type of thing so they're uh they're they're basically completely different games there's no similarity besides the fact that the camera is in your head that's the only similarity <laughs> and there's guns <laughs> and there are gu- well yeah i mean even the guns are in overwatch are right. maybe not even considered guns by modern standards yeah. they're like electricity right the now, so. shooting in pubg yeah. throws me off so much because you know in in overwatch with widowmaker you point you click and that's where the bullet hits. That's where the storyline ends. Yeah. In <laughs> PUBG, you have to take into account altitude and distance and travel time and all these things. It's, I don't know, it's a whole whole new piece. It's a pretty entertaining game, though. Oh, yeah. It's definitely I- been a very interesting stage within the Overwatch community for the last six months. I mean, we've seen a lot of people just being like, uh, going into transitioning from full-time streaming into Overwatch League. You also have people going from full-time streaming just to not being Overwatch streamers anymore. They're just doing another game or they're going into something that is basically just going into variety streaming. Um, even Andres and I are kind of getting the bug to like do something else um, because it's just been so much of the same. It's very samey. And uh, like I picked up yeah. Subnautica. I picked up um like i know some people have just picked up dragon ball fighters this last oh, week yeah. that's, oh that's i've been really thinking, thinking about picking awesome. that one up yeah is it looks really fun yeah. i may have to just pull the trigger on it yeah if you, I've heard uh, you if need you like... to have a controller for it though um it's it's probably the most generous fighting game to play with uh with with not like a real fight stick or a real fight pad or anything like that mm-hmm. um but yeah w- when it comes to overwatch <laughs> i think that one thing that they're doing is they're really uh i think that they're holding the game to too much of uh this this high level like for counter-strike for example you have counter-strike or brood war or uh you know games that games that are very old right counter-strike is 16 actually 18 years old 17 years old at this point right so it makes sense that well it got here through this huge arduous history and changing it at this point you want to be very careful make small tweaks i think that uh Overwatch is still in the states, it's still very young. Like, I mean, we should be seeing poop, boom, 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 boom changes like every every month, every two weeks even. Um, and you know, to go six months without changes, clearly, clearly, it's the game's not perfect uh, in just a year. That's silly. Do you think that sometimes they're tied down a little bit by things like their storyline or the character personalities that they've built behind certain characters, and they're afraid of losing certain identity? For example. In Mercy's case, her resurrection is such an iconic part of the character since the beginning and the inception of the game that maybe the thought of removing resurrection for the health of the game, it's out of the question because of the setup that they've kind of like led up to it. Well, here's the thing. I mean, resurrect, you could balance resurrect. It's not impossible, I don't think. It's it's probably something you can do. I think that... Probably the biggest thing, and you can tell this, right? The Overwatch developers, they were making an MMO. The head, the lead developer, Jeff Kaplan, he's done MMOs. His bit, his main background as a competitive gamer was through MMOs. Uh, his, his the only major game he's ever developed is an MMO, except for the one week he did Warcraft Three or whatever. And you can kind of tell that in how he balances stuff, right? A lot of times he, the the team will focus more on trying to change the, the the stuff around the game in a very meta macro sense. It's like, oh, well, if Symmetra and Torbjorn and One Tricks are the problem, it's not, I mean, we're not going to balance the game. Instead, we should, you know, ban them or maybe not ban them or, or maybe we'll ban them. No one knows. Or, or we'll change it or we'll make it grouping, grouping with parties and stuff. If Mercy is considered too strong, maybe we'll just try to convince people that they're not, she's not too strong and stuff. So um, I, I think that they're kind of taking an MMO mentality to an FPS game. And it's uh, it's not it's not the most optimal way to 
go about things, I don't think. Fair enough. Fair enough. There's something that I wanted to kind of throw in here, and I'm sure that a lot of the stuff that Sky's bringing up is, you know, relevant and, like, poignant on this particular point. But kind of to build off of the MMO style of mentality, I feel like your their team has got... And I'm not trying to be a Blizzard apologist. That's what people like throw shade on. People have, like trying to defend Blizzard, but just to take another, for the sake of argument, right? Another point is I'm wondering when they've accommodated the second teams and other assets to do everything with Overwatch League. Just how much of their attention is kind of like split, and like even though their team is really large now, it's almost like I feel like there's it's kind of the chefs there's too many chefs in the kitchen to like get something done and it's like they're kind of do too much in one way and then on the other side of the of this style of discussion is it's almost like you have people pulling and vying for attention with all kinds of different things that are like absolutely necessary it's almost like you just can't put any of the fires out because everything's on fire (laughs) you know what i mean yeah so uh yeah that's exactly that's what i mean they're not really they're not focusing on the game as far as they're concerned the game is not, I mean, they're not, they wouldn't say this, right? They don't, they probably wouldn't vocalize this even to themselves that, but as far they've been acting like the game is basically done, right? Where it's like, okay, the game is how it is. We, we can tweak some minor stuff, but the, the game is good. Instead, we'll focus on all the stuff around the game. Like it's a, a perfect title after one year. And I even, I mean, you know, if you ask a Blizzard dev, did Overwatch League, League affect the development of the actual game? They'll say, absolutely not. That's a ridiculous statement. That's not true at all. Uh, but you could definitely tell. You could definitely tell. I mean, you saw in uh, in the trailers and stuff for Overwatch League. Jeff was always there. The team was always there, always working on the observing tools and everything. That that must have taken a ton of time away from the actual game. And uh, even more dangerous, you have to think about the, you know, if you focus too much on the Overwatch League and things like that as a developer, it sort of starts to, your perspective starts to skew a little bit, and the game starts to become less important in comparison. Ah, that's a, those are some, are some interesting points, and definitely some of the problems they must have to be wrestling with right now. So many different perspectives, so many standpoints that you can take on how to balance the game, right? Do you balance it for new audiences? Do you balance it for the most competitive players out there? Do you try to do a little bit of both? Are you balancing it based on, on story and feel, or are you doing it based on hard numbers? I don't know. There's so many approaches, and I'm sure that... Figuring that out is not an easy task. Yeah. Uh, There's well, also I'll like... Just, oh, go I'll, ahead, just say, go. I'll just say one more thing. Um, and that's that... So you said that... Uh, talking about Blizzard Apologists, I've been a Blizzard Apologist for, you know, forever. My channel has just been like... <laughs> this is not Blizzard Apologist <laughs> Anonymous, okay? <laughs> my, 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 yeah, my, my channel for the past uh, year and a half has just been like, hey guys, back off, you know, give them, give them a shot, give them a chance. And my tune has only changed... Like, the only time... All right. A lot of people, they complain all the time. So I think that their complaints kind of uh, become noise after a while. Like, I, I never complain. I've never complained in the history of my 150 videos. Everything has always been positive until Mercy specifically. I mean, uh, game developers, everything is always complicated, right? Every single time they ever talk about something, it's like, oh, see, it's so it's really complicated. It's complicated. You got to give them the benefit of the doubt because maybe you just don't understand. Maybe you can't sympathize with them. But I mean, when you have Mercy for six months... <laughs> It's it's impossible. Like you can't justify that. It's it. literally do anything. Anything is better than nothing in that case. Well, we're uh, about to see because uh, the finally something has been done, and it looks we like we are seeing some <laughs> results. We'll get into that a little bit at the end of the episode. As Switch from Om- Omnic Meta has been very kind to supply us with some statistics on the new Mercy patch. It's still a little early, but regardless, you know there are some results coming out that we can actually start to see. So as we transition into the Junker Town, we have a quick update. We're going to try and target the final Friday in February, which would be the 23rd for the next game night. But we haven't locked it in with our admins and making sure everyone will be there. So there is a slight chance this might get bumped to the first week of March. Or this, um, I very, very much doubt it will be a week from Friday. But we'll we'll, we'll get back to you on that and... Um, We'll we'll cover that next week. We'll hopefully lock that in this week. Uh, like we mentioned, Omnic Meta is one of our partners here on Omnic Lab. So if you want to go check that out, we will be linking his homepage in the show notes. You'll definitely want to go check that out because all of the stuff we're talking about is not yet released yet. 
Um, we also have the sister show, Omnic or oh, Omnic recap, OWL recap <laughs> that Andres t- produces with Blaze and Bob and Aid Marrow and also the newly acquired Melarena. So you guys can go check that out at OWL recap on Twitter or their OWL recap.com. Special thanks to our diamond sponsors. Those of you doing a lot of the heavy lifting and making sure Andres and I can actually go to BlizzCon uh, at all. Uh, so these guys are at the top level. We have Chris to play a good Apollo, Golden Soldier A, Great Root Bear, Kip, Lysum, Magic, Jan Jinkle, which uh, is my my dual Q partner, man. We've been <laughs> pulling it together this last week. Ricky Tiki, Shazir, Top Score Solutions, and Tragic Zach. Thank you guys for your continued support. And also... Not to negate anybody else that is also supporting at the lower tiers. You guys are great, and every little bit helps uh, more than you would ever imagine. But without further ado, Andres, the floor is yours. Let's talk Junkertown. Let's jump right into it. All right. Before we get into the heavy stuff, into the detailed stuff, let's do like a roundabout about Junkertown. What is it about the map? What is it that people have to take in mind when they're traveling to Junkertown, whether they're attacking or defending? What are some of the features of the map that stand out when you first see it that you're like, hmm, maybe this here will stand out or hmm, this strategy might work over here. I'm going to pass it to you, Sky, and see what you think. Well, the first thing you, you see when you look at Junkertown is that it's a very meandery type of map. And it, it really switches very rapidly between being meandering, maze-like, really short, close quarters to being suddenly opened up into uh, long-range type right. of angles. And it does that several times throughout the map. Mm-hmm. It starts off close, becomes long within the first point. The second point's close, the third point's long, and then you get around the corner and it gets short again. So it's definitely a really chaotic map. It's a difficult map if you follow Overwatch League and, you, and if you watch those matches. It's a difficult map to watch because it's like everything's just going on all, all the time. And, uh, well, it, it really matches up with Junk Rat's personality. <laughs> it does. <laughs> it's hazardous. It's, it's a map that, right off the bat, I think about heroes, for example, like Farah not being very successful in this map. There's not a lot of places to cover. It's a, it's a very open environment, especially in that first point. It's an environment that is very conducive of snipers, for example. Lots of open areas, lots of long sight lines and places where snipers can jump you from lateral sides. Um, it's not a place that Reaper, for example, excels at either for the same reason. Open fields just... It's not his thing. He cannot be running around the middle of a field because, you know, he just doesn't have any range. <clears throat> any other heroes that kind of stand out to you guys in Junkertown? So, Junk, Junkrat, ha- actually, you know, Junkrat's situationally pretty okay on Junkertown. You definitely see him played on the map. Like, it's, I mean, Bastion has got to be the one you talk about, right? Bastion is right. The, the man of the hour on the map. And for some really interesting, you know, the map just really comes together in this perfect way. Like if someone were to make a map where Bastion would be the best possible on, uh, you know, within reason, (laughs) Junkertown feels like that map because uh, we'll talk a little bit later and how it all falls into place for that hero particularly. Absolutely. Rob, anything else you want to add in here before we get into the nitty gritty? I mean, all the stuff I want to talk about is all the nitty gritty stuff. So all right, (laughs) let's get Let's get right into it. (laughs) Let's go into the first point of Junkertown. Let's start from the attacker's perspective and move in the map into this. From Overwatch League, I think we've gotten a good sample size of what some of the pros like doing this map. Like you mentioned before, Sky, Bastion is one of the preferred heroes. I think the protected president strategy, it's probably the preferred strategy on this map. We don't see it so often in other maps, especially like Numbani or Dorado. Sometimes they will pull it out but not as often as they pull it out in Junkertown. And why is that? Why is Bastion so popular in this map? Well, we have Junkertown. If you look at the first point, it looks very wide open, and it looks like the world is your oyster, and you can do whatever you want, and it's uh, very sandboxy in nature, but it really isn't, because on the far right-hand side of the map, when you first exit as the attacker, on the far right-hand side, it just leads into sort of nowhere. Because remember, the defenders always stand back on that high ground in the middle middle section, right? So if you can't bypass that, uh, it's it's pointless with a flank, right? So the right, right side flank doesn't go far enough. The left side flank doesn't go anywhere. 
except for this very narrow choke point that is uh, very exposed to the one place that the defenders always stand in. So you pretty much only have one choice as attackers, and that's just to go. Just go straight up the middle uh, with very little cute type of stuff you can do. Uh, (laughs) So you need to just just bust through. And if a team is sitting up there with the shield, I mean, remember when Junkertown first came out? People would get held at the first, you know, just at the the gates Mm -hmm. so much, right? It's because you put a shield there, you put two shields there with Arissa or Reinhardt, and suddenly you can't really punch through because there's no way to get around it. There's nothing cute you can do. You just need to go and ram into it until you lose. Uh, with Bastion, however, Bastion's great because you can punch through the shield. And on the first point of Junkertown, once you punch through that initial shield, they have to back all the way up to be- to the beginning. There's really no in-between there. So once you break that initial hold, they have to go all the way back. And junk- and with with Bastion, you can just push all the way up. That's why you also see... Hanzo and Widowmaker picked off on the map because Bastion will just automatically get you through that first point, that first part rather, not the first point, the first part of the first point, and then Widowmaker and Hanzo can take over when you get to that big wide open sort of area. That makes a lot of sense. And it, you're totally right. Bastion provides that huge firepower that you need to be able to carry the payload through that very contested choke point that, like you said, is always shields down over there. Widow and Hanzo like you said, are the picks that people have been choosing to go along with Bastion because not only what you said, once you get to the point right after that bridge where it's very open, it's like Widow's hunting ground, basically. Before that, you also have these two lateral sides. And what you said, they're not really flanks, but Widow and Hanzo can sort of take advantage of the high ground that those two lateral sides provide and do the same, bypass the shield that has been set up in the bridge and try to get those shots through the shields, through the Orisa, into their supports, into their backline, and alleviate the pressure that's going on. And you see that happening all the time because at that point, the defenders have three huge threads that they have to be worrying about. They have a Bastion coming through the middle, and they have a Hanzo and Widow just poking, jumping up and down uh, from the sides, which... It's it's what they do, right? Widow and Hansa are good at climbing to that high ground. Pretty much everything that I've been able to see on this map that is, you know, the whole thing that they call pirate ship, which is basically the the ship's sail is a shield or two, and then Bastion is the, the stern, I guess you could say. But um, you set up on the payload, and the payload sails through the oceans very, very smoothly. But basically, I think why you're also going to want to sh- select heroes like Hanzo or heroes like I've even seen some people try to use Mei just to kind of like offset a little bit of the, the the barrier damage um just so you can kind of get a quick setup or a, force your own flank routes um but it's again it's less effective because Bastion can rip through the walls very very efficiently especially when you're running it alongside heroes like Arisa because you're basically doubling the damage and shooting from behind a barrier and then you have Hanzo and Widowmaker that's given the chance, can also continually dish out high amounts of damage to barriers and basically bust a barrier in a matter of less than, I would even say less than three seconds, maybe even less than two seconds if everything's getting focused. Because there's no damage fall off for arrows, there's no damage fall off for Widow stuff beyond the charge rate of the rifle. And then Bastion 